and welcome to Church Online. Now, in case you and I aren't lucky enough to have met each other before, my name is Cliff Rinder, and I have the honor of filling in for Pastor George Lim today. Now, either that means that Pastor George trusts me a whole lot, or maybe he just wants to make sure that you know how good you've got it by comparison when he gets back. In either case, I'm delighted and humbled to be able to be here with you today. As you'll soon discover, I'm really nothing special, but fortunately, I do know someone who is. I've been privileged to love the Lord for the bulk of my 48 years here on planet Earth. I currently serve at the River Church as a coach, a River Kids teacher, and a life group leader. My wife, Mitzi, and I have been here at the River Church for a little over two years. We came all the way from Birmingham, Alabama for a job. Well, at least I thought it was for a job. At the same time that my former employer was undergoing upheaval in its leadership team and I was in the process of praying for direction and casually perusing job boards, a group of people here in Glastonbury at a small but stable fellowship called the River Church was praying to God to send workers for the harvest. Now, that prayer set into motion a series of gears that led to a recruiter reaching out to me via email, asking me if I would be interested in moving to Glastonbury, Connecticut. Well, I was born in Alabama. I was raised in Alabama. I went to school in Alabama. I got married in Alabama. I still have most of my family in Alabama. So I did what any self-respecting Southerner would do with an opportunity like that, an opportunity to move up north. I promptly deleted the email and didn't think anything more about it. As I saw it, my situation at work wasn't ideal, but I still worked for a good Christian man who had my back, cared about his people, and trusted and valued my opinion. So I figured I can write it out a little longer. Well, the very next day after I deleted that email, I was called into the CFO's office and informed that my boss, that good Christian man who had my back and really cared about his people, yeah, he was being let go. And I could choose to stay on without him under new leadership, or I could leave with him. How's that for God trying to get my attention? I went home promptly undeleted that email, replied to the recruiter that, yes, I would be delighted to hear more about the opportunity. And so here I am, an Alabama boy married to a North Carolina girl living around 750 miles away from his closest family and over a thousand miles away from his mama. But our time here has been an incredible blessing to us. And I know that it'll continue for as long as God wants us here. Well, today, we're going to continue in our series on recalibrating using the book of Acts. We're going to learn four lessons from the life of the ministry of a man named Philip. He, too, was called by God to go to a faraway land with no idea what might await him. But before we get to that part of the story... We're going to dig into his past a little bit and see what we can learn from the spiritual journey that led him there. Our story begins with the early Christian church in Jerusalem. It all starts off with what those in the theater would call an initiating conflict. Let's start by reading Acts 6, 1. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. All right, here in Acts chapter 6, we see that the church in Jerusalem is growing. It's grown so fast, in fact, that it was having trouble meeting the needs of all the widows in church. Now, it's important to note that taking care of the widows was a social service that had been a charge of the church since its earliest inception. But because of the speed at which the church in Jerusalem had grown, they had more widows than the system set up by the church could care for effectively. In verse 2, we read, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. 
That sounds a little rough, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. But it was actually a wise move. The apostles knew that while this need was great, the need for teaching and preaching was even greater. The church at Jerusalem was still a young church and full of new believers needing to be fed so that they could grow. Without proper teaching and preaching, those young Christians couldn't grow into the types of leaders of the faith that were needed to continue the mission of Christ. And the apostles recognized that. They realized that it was time to add to the leadership team. Now, this was the first time that we know of that they had added to their leadership structure. So it was critical that they get it right. The apostles knew that they had to establish godly criteria for this next generation of leaders. So that's what they did in verses 3 and 4. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. All right, so here's the criteria that the apostles set out. Number one, they must be of good repute or reputation. They need to be generally well thought of. And that makes sense, right? If you're having issues, you don't pick someone people don't trust to solve the problem. You pick someone trustworthy, someone with a track record of kindness, of gentle words, someone that people want to be around. Now, the other important point to note here is that in order to have a good reputation, you have to actually be known. You have to be involved and engaged. You need to be an active part of your community. All right, criteria number two, they must be full of the Spirit. Now, this one is a little trickier. Being full of the Spirit comes through frequent and selfless prayer, diligent Bible study, and meditation on the things of God. It's important to note that being full of the Spirit isn't a final milestone that we can achieve when we can just sit back and be happy that we've finally made it to the state of fullness. No, achieving fullness in this area really just unlocks our next level of growth. To be full in the Spirit we must be continually filling and refilling ourselves. You know what the other thing is about being full? Sometimes things that are full spill over. Sometimes a vessel just can't contain all of its contents, and the goodness inside just gets all over everyone around it. That's what it means to be full of the Spirit. The third criteria they established was that they must be full of wisdom. Now, being full of wisdom means being able to make sound judgments. It means being able to see right paths when the rightness of those paths isn't immediately apparent. Being full of wisdom is different from being full of knowledge in that having knowledge just involves facts, but with wisdom, you actually know what to do with those facts. This reminds me of the story of a dean that I read about once. This dean was gathered with his staff for a meeting when an angel appeared and told him that in return for his unselfish and exemplary behavior, the Lord was going to grant him a reward with his choice of infinite wealth, wisdom, or beauty. He could pick. Without hesitating, that dean selected infinite wisdom. Done, said the angel and he disappeared in a cloud of smoke and a bolt of lightning. All heads turned towards the dean, who sat surrounded by a faint halo of light. After an initial silence, one of his colleagues finally whispered, Say something wise. The dean looked right at him and said, I should have taken the money. <laughs> you see, sometimes wisdom illuminates truths you didn't expect. So, the apostles, they looked for their leaders to have a good reputation, to be full of the Spirit, and to be full of wisdom. But notice, the apostles didn't want them 
to be able to build a good reputation, to be working on being full of the Spirit, and to strive to be full of wisdom. No, they wanted them to already be meeting those required criteria. And that brings us to our first lesson from the life of Philip. Lesson number one is to prepare before you're called. How many of you have ever had a flat tire? Well, back in my day where I grew up, they didn't have run flat tires or roadside assistance or even reliable cell phone coverage. Many people had to learn the hard way over the years that the right time to check the air pressure in the spare tire is not when you found yourself pulled over with a flat. It was before you ever got into the car to start your journey. You see, if you wait until you're needed to start preparing, you've waited too long. You need to start preparing before you're called. And that is exactly what our boy Philip did. Let's continue our reading with verses 5 through 7. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So, Philip, along with six others, was selected for this new leadership role. Now, we don't know for sure if he was aware of what he was being called upon to do. As far as we know, he had been nominated and elected without even knowing about the issue he was being called upon to address. I like to think of Philip as having been excited to get the news about being selected to be a new leader in the church. I imagine what it must have been like for him to have been called into the presence of the apostles, godly men who knew Christ personally and taught his word with truth and power. Philip would have entered and was just finding out about the new and important leadership role that he would be taking on. Was he going to be sent out to a neighboring city to share the gospel? Were they asking him to lead a Bible study on the scriptures? Or maybe they wanted to head him, him to head up a healing ministry or a prayer ministry or lead a kids class on Sunday morning. No, actually, he was being elevated to the highly esteemed role of lunch lady. Yeah, that's right. The daily distribution that we read about in verse one was essentially just handing out food. As I mentioned earlier, the church has always been charged with caring for widows, and the church of Jerusalem did this by serving them meals on a daily basis. Apparently, the traditional help yourself approach to food distribution just wasn't quite cutting it. So Philip and his companions had been selected to figure out how to serve a better meal and how to do it fairly. And so we've now come to our second lesson from the life of Philip, the lunch lady. Lesson two is to serve where there's a need. Or as the apostles put it, Philip, sometimes you've just got to throw on a hairnet, roll up your sleeves, and get to work. Not all of the work in the kingdom of God is glamorous. In fact, it's usually not. As we've learned repeatedly throughout this year, life is messy and poopy and sloppy and gross. But this is the lunchroom that God has given us to work in, and there's a station for every one of us, well, except the ice cream station, of course, because I'm calling dibs on that one. Well, as Christians, we should be open to all opportunities to serve, not just the ones that we think are the good ones. If you see a need, look for a way to meet it. Don't just hand it off to someone else on a comment card or complain about it after the fact. Think about how you personally can help solve that problem and ask for the opportunity. 
Well, the next time we see our favorite lunch lady, or would it be lunch lad? The next time we see Philip is in Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8, following the martyrdom of Stephen, who was one of his fellow lunchroom workers. Now, timing-wise, this was before Saul's conversion to Christianity, and Saul was in full-on persecution mode. Believers are being beaten, imprisoned, and killed. Saul was trying his best to stamp out this young and growing church, and his attacks did have an effect. They had scattered many of the church's leaders out of Jerusalem and into the neighboring lands. Little did he know, however, that he was playing right into God's plan. Let's read, starting at verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in the city. You see, God has a secret formula for ministry. It's secret because the evil one never seems to see it coming. Here it is. It's obedience plus persecution equals miracles and a mighty harvest. It would have been easy for Philip to just go into hiding under Saul's persecution. He could have convinced himself that it was the right thing to do, but he didn't. You see, Philip knew that the calling of God was not dependent on the condition of his circumstances. God's love and provision certainly isn't conditional, so why should his obedience be? Are you currently going through a hard time? Is the devil orchestrating circumstances to distract you from what you know you should be doing? That's all the more reason to be obedient. In fact, when you're under persecution, whether it's direct or indirect, that's the time to double down. You see, when persecution and trouble is added to a believer's obedience, that's when God does his finest and most impressive work. Think about it this way. How many great things can you cook without applying heat and fire? You see, heat is often required to take ingredients to the next level. And you know what? This doesn't just apply to Philip. It also applies to us, and it applied to Jesus, too. It was his death on the cross that broke the bonds of sin and death forever. Obedience plus persecution equals miracles and a mighty harvest. Philip faithfully fulfilled his calling to minister, even while he fled the city. The Philip that we encounter here had graduated to teaching and preaching, and he continued to do so, even under duress and under the threat of pain and death. The Bible tells us that the gospel and the power of his preaching was so strong that evil spirits fled from their hosts, and the sick were healed. It's not bad for a simple lunchroom worker, is it? Our little Philip has now earned himself the new title of Philip the Evangelist. And just in case you're wondering, when we talk about persecution, it doesn't have to be something as extreme as being beaten, killed, and imprisoned. It can even be simple things, like have you ever noticed that you always seem to face the most difficulty when you're headed in the right direction? When your prayer life is just taking off, you get a new project at work that takes up more of your time and you stop prioritizing prayer. When your personal Bible study time is really getting engaging, you get assigned a book report at school and you decide you'll stop just long enough to read the book and write that report but you never go back. 
And I won't even talk about what happens to us all on Sunday mornings when we're just trying to get out the door to go to church. What about when the power goes out right in the middle of the church? Do you call it a wrap? Grab the kids, head home with the intent to watch the pre-recorded service online? No, you don't. You continue lifting up your voice in praise right there in the dark, and you are not deterred. When we're on the right path is when the world will strike. But we don't have to be amazing prayer warriors or incredibly gifted memorizers of the scripture in order to grow. We just have to be obedient to carry on. I can guarantee you that persecution will follow. But if we persevere, so will the miracles and the harvest. And that is lesson number three from the life of Philip. Grow through obedience. Our final lesson today from the life of Philip is lesson four, go wherever God directs. Now this lesson comes from the end of this chapter in Acts 8, 26 through 40. Now I'm not gonna read all of this passage because of time, so that's your homework. Read Acts 8, 8, 26 through 40. In this passage, Philip was confronted with a messenger from God who told him to go down and take the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. As the scripture says in verse 26, this was a road leading out into the desert. It was a path that led off to the southernmost city in the region before it just headed off to Egypt and to what they referred to as the ends of the earth. The angel gave no context. The angel gave no reason for the journey. He just told Philip to go. Have you ever noticed that the more time you spend thinking about something challenging and daunting, the harder it actually is to do that thing? You think of all the challenges and problems, and you end up talking yourself out of it. Well, Philip didn't do that. Philip just up and left his thriving, bountiful ministry at its height to run off to the middle of nowhere. He had no idea why he was going there or how long he was going to be there. He didn't pack a bag. He didn't book reservations at inns along the way or plan for the sights he would see as he traveled. He just trusted God and went. And it's a good thing that he did because he just barely made it to his destination in time. While Philip was traveling, he happened on a chariot carrying a traveler from Ethiopia. He was prompted again by the Spirit, this time to go to the chariot. He had to actually run to catch up with the chariot, but he did catch it. The Ethiopian, you see, was seeking the truth. He had been to the Jewish temple in Jerusalem seeking answers, but was headed back home still having difficulties interpreting the scriptures. What better time to encounter an evangelist? You see, God had ordained an entirely unlikely meeting off in the desert in the middle of nowhere. And thanks to Philip's faith and instant obedience, that appointment was kept and another soul was added to the family of God. Even more than that, This soul was now armed with the gospel of Jesus Christ and sent off to the ends of the earth with the truth that gives life. So in closing, I'd like to ask you to think about whether or not you're fulfilling your calling today. If you're not, why not? Is it a problem of preparation? Is there more that you need to do to prepare for the next phase of your life in Christ? Is it a problem of not having found the right place to serve? Or is it that you know where to serve, but you're finding excuses not to? My challenge for you today is for you to open your heart to the life that Christ has for you in his service. 
What do you need to do to get prepared, to begin to serve, to be obedient, and to be open for His will in your life, wherever it may take you? Let's pray. Oh God of heaven, God of all people and of all kingdoms, we pray, Lord, that you would move our spirits, that you would make your ways plain to us, that you would illuminate our paths, that you would stand before us pointing the way. Help us, Lord, to be open to your will for our lives. Help us, Lord, to be willing to follow you wherever you would have us to go. I thank you, Lord, for each and every person listening to this today. And I pray, Lord, for your calling on each and every one of their lives. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for joining us for Church Online. If this was your first time joining us, please scan the QR code on the screen to fill out a Connect card online. We'd love to say hello, or maybe even send you a gift. Also, if you have any prayer requests, or you'd like to know more about the River Church, or you've made a decision to follow Christ today, or to embrace the Lord's calling for your life, if any of these things are true, we want to hear from you. There's a really easy way to do that on our website. Just visit riverchurchct.com, or you can text the keyword TRC Connect to the number 94000. Thanks for coming. God bless you. Have a great day.